Honourable Senators, I rise today to, to voice my opposition to this motion. Even in the face of this pandemic, we have been making in-person Senate sittings work, and it has worked safely for the past eight months with a, with a smaller crew of staff and Senators. We should explore further options for making these in-person sittings larger and more inclusive while preserving safety measures, rather than create a virtual system that may create more problems than it solves. Across Canada, other organizations and businesses have returned to in-person work with modifications for safety in this pandemic. Why not Parliament? A virtual system of Parliament requires significant trade-offs. As a detailed House of Commons study found in June, a hybrid sitting would require double the number of staff to be present, and they must be present in person, not virtually. It compromises the ability of Senators to do much of our work that happens behind the scenes. The in-person meetings, the pull-aside conversations in the Senate chamber or in the hallways, the negotiations that occur and the relationships that form when Senators work in the same place physically. I've even persuaded other senators to vote a certain way through conversations in the chamber while the whips are walking down the aisle right before a vote. Some of you will remember the debates we had in 2014 on the assisted suicide legislation. Many senators have pointed to that debate as the most meaningful of their careers, in large part due to the very personal and emotional nature of our discussion. We will soon have another assisted suicide bill before us, Bill C-7. How will that debate translate online? This is quite literally a matter of life and death. Virtual discussions are a poor substitute for in-person debate on issues of such magnitude. The hybrid sitting motion before us today requires senators to compromise transparency, accountability, and even our effectiveness as parliamentarians. It lessens senators' ability to challenge the government and establishes dangerous precedents for the erosion of the rights of senators within the chamber. Oddly, the specific terms of this particular hybrid motion ignore many of the lessons our House of Commons colleagues have learned through that chamber's experiment with virtual parliament. As you know, honourable senators, one of our most fundamental roles as senators is to represent our regions in this place. Virtual parliament jeopardizes that critical purpose. Problems with internet connectivity, especially in rural and remote areas, mean that senators may not have the opportunity to voice their region's concerns in this chamber. This could also mean a senator could miss a crucial vote or fail to hear a significant portion of debate that might influence how he or she chooses to vote on any given matter. I submit that dropped connectivity should be considered a breach of parliamentary privilege, as it creates a circumstance outside a senator's control that impedes a senator from carrying out his or her duties in the Senate. Another pitfall of virtual parliament is the potential for abuse or manipulation of the system. Members connecting virtually are subject to the control of one chair. In the case of the Senate chamber, that would be the Speaker. Respectfully, I would not expect this to be a problem with you, Speaker, but we have seen committee chairs in the House of Commons abruptly adjourn virtual meetings by simply cutting the mics of protesting members whose opposition is clearly in order. Whereas a senator attending a sitting in person could continue to protest and their objections would be seen by others, members attending virtually from their homes have no other recourse. This creates a terrible precedent. I see several specific problems with the motion for hybrid Senate sittings that is before us today. First is the vague wording throughout the motion. It says that video conference technology will be approved, quote, from time to time by the Speaker in consultation with caucus leaders. It asks senators to submit documents to the clerk, quote, as far in advance as possible. What do these terms mean? More precise language is necessary, honourable senators. My major concern with this motion and the vagueness of its language is that it leaves the door open for the Speaker, who is appointed by the government, to assume additional powers. The Speaker of the Senate plays a different role in the Senate than the Speaker in the House of Commons does. Unlike in the Commons, the Senate Speaker is a servant of this chamber, traditionally known as the first among equals. But some of the language in this motion suggests an opening for the encroachment of Speaker's powers over the will of Senators. For example, Clause 5, which governs variants from usual Senate procedures for technical reasons, and Clause 9, which gives the Speaker the right to adjourn for technical reasons, are subject to appeal to the Senate only if technically feasible. What does that mean? that there will be situations in which the Senate cannot appeal the decision of the Speaker in either changing the procedures of the Senate or adjourning it altogether? This is unacceptable. Clause 8 indicates that the Speaker is authorized to suspend the sitting as required for technical and other reasons. I am very uncomfortable with how vague that is. 
What else could fall under other reasons, and who is to determine what a valid other reason is? All senators should reflect carefully on the potential ramifications of giving the Speaker of the Senate such undefined power, particularly when no right of appeal to the chamber is specified in that section. The language in the bill is much too vague for such substantial powers. Furthermore, this sets a dangerous precedent. We as a chamber must retain the right to appeal decisions of the Speaker, especially decisions of suspension or adjournment, because they necessarily involve ending or silencing debate. We must avoid imprecise language that leaves any shred of doubt about senators' rights in this regard, temporarily or otherwise. I have serious concerns about Clause 11, which allows for the adjournment of debate on a privilege motion. Parliamentary privilege is the protection of our ability to carry out our parliamentary functions as senators in this place, and it is of paramount importance. The rules of the Senate state at Rule 13-1, quote, the preservation of the privileges of the Senate is the duty of every senator and has priority over every other matter before the Senate, quote. We should not allow the adjournment of debate on the crucial matter of a parliamentary privilege motion, particularly when the hybrid system of parliament we are using is likely to increase the incidence of privilege infractions. I have many concerns about the mechanics of a hybrid parliament, particularly around debate and voting. I find it puzzling that the voting procedure and the voting order laid out in this motion is so different than the one the House of Commons has been using for several weeks. As one important example, the House of Commons discovered very quickly that in order for the camera to be triggered and show each member as they vote, it was necessary for each MP attending virtually to speak a full sentence stating their intended vote. This Senate motion proposes no such requirement. Senators online are simply to hold up voting cards. It is my understanding that this voting card system is based on the hybrid system used in British Columbia. However, it is also my understanding that the BC Legislature does not allow the use of those voting cards for standing votes. Instead, each member must state their vote verbally. Under the system laid out in this motion, senators sitting in person in the Senate chamber will not be able to see the image of each online senator as they vote. As far as I can tell, neither will the public. Instead, the clerk or speaker will simply call out the senator's name and record their vote. I have a huge issue with the lack of public accountability in this proposed system. It is not good enough for the clerk or the speaker simply to state that he or she saw a senator vote. Even setting aside the potential for abuse under a system, this does not make the Senate transparent to Canadians. Some of you may remember how long we fought in this place to broadcast video of our Senate deliberations to Canadians. We have only started doing so within the last two years. And now we are considering a hybrid parliamentary system where many senators' votes are not even visible to this chamber and to the public on screen? That is completely unacceptable, and it should concern us all. As senators, voting is our most important obligation, and we have a responsibility to be transparent and accountable in the way we cast our votes. Just as they say, justice must not only be done, justice must also be seen to be done, so too must voting be seen to be done. Added to this is my concern about what else will be visible to senators, both in the chamber and online during Senate sittings. Will we be able to see, for example, which senators online have indicated a request to speak? I watched the Internal Economy Committee meeting conducted on Zoom last week, when the committee was discussing the important issue of the $100 million Senate financial statements. The chair, Senator Marwa, said he could not see the raised hand of any of the three committee members online who had been waiting for a turn to speak. One of those affected senators was our own opposition leader, Senator Plett, who expressed pr frustration at the experience. If hybrid sitting were to operate in a similar fashion, the situation would be pro profoundly frustrating for us all. And if our intervention is inadvertently missed by the clerk or the speaker, or we have an internet connection issue that drops our access to the online Senate sitting during a debate or a vote, we are supposed to contact Senate IT via phone. I have a lot of questions about how that will work. Will this be the same main IT number the entire Senate with 900 employees uses? What if the line is busy, as it frequently is, or several senators lose connectivity at the same time? What if it happens outside of normal Senate IT working hours? What if the entire Senate server goes down for an extended period of time, as happened in late June while we were sitting in this chamber and the government leader right at that time was trying to persuade us about the merits of virtual parliament? 
If senators in the chamber could see the senators attending virtually, we might be able to alert the speaker or the clerk to the problem. If the speaker and the clerk are the only ones able to see who is requesting to speak and how senators are voting, there is no public accountability. This prevents us as senators from doing our jobs properly. As you know, honourable senators, being able to see what other senators are doing during the sitting and how they are voting can at times be key to how we discharge our duties in this place and the strategic choices we make. Speaking of strategy, I am also concerned about several provisions in this motion that remove or restrict tools that are especially important to the opposition in the Senate. This is especially disturbing considering this Trudeau government's previously stated goal to eliminate the opposition in the Senate. Among these are the provisions in Clause 7 that mandate earlier end times of Senate sittings. This necessarily ad advantages the government, whose business in the Senate daily schedule would be completed by that time, while potentially shortchanging the opposition and all other independent senators. In that vein, I find it very odd at Clause 14 that the motion includes a provision to, quote, strongly encourage all senators to give advance notice as far in advance as possible to the clerk if they intend to intervene or table documents during the sitting. First, it's bizarre for a motion to strongly encourage anything. That's language for an email, not a Senate motion and proposed sessional order. And finally, Honourable Senators, because this motion lists a December 18th end date, why are we spending what will likely be a massive amount of taxpayers' dollars on a system that may only be in place for a measly six weeks? In comparison, the House of Commons has had an operational hybrid system for most of the last six months. The amount of money the Senate has already spent on hybrid Parliament had not been disclosed prior to today, not only to the public, but not even to every Senator in this place. Senator Gold did reference a $400,000 cost amount in its question period today, but no final cost has yet been provided. And this amount was apparently approved behind closed doors, hidden from public scrutiny. That is not transparency. That is not accountability. Withholding that information from senators voting on this motion fails to give us the information we need to determine whether a significant amount of taxpayers' dollars is being spent wisely and whether this move to a hybrid parliament is worth the expense if it's in place for only six weeks. In conclusion, I have grave concerns about hybrid parliament in general, but especially with the parameters outlined in this motion. There are many red flags in this proposal, the increased potential for the misuse or undermining of our parliamentary processes, the threat to the effective representation of the interests of our regions in Parliament, and the ceding of some of our most important parliamentary rights as Senators. This motion has many flaws and demands the application of our sober second thought, Honourable Senators. I hope you will keep all of this in mind as you vote on this motion. Thank you. Question, question, Senator, Senator Batters, will you take a question? Senator Flip. Uh, thank you, Senator Batters. Uh, just one question, and you did. <clears throat> you did, I think, answer it at the very, very end of your, uh, of your intervention. But uh, you, are, um, you are fairly faithful in watching SEBA meetings, and, um, and I know that. Uh, and in all of your watching of SEBA meetings, you never saw that there was $400,000 being spent, so this was not a, a public, this was not out there for the public to, to see. Is that, is that correct? Senator Batters. That is correct. I've watched, I, I was Deputy Chair of SEBA until April, and since that time I've watched each of the in public uh, meetings that SEBA has, and that motion was not approved by SEBA in public. So I'm assuming it must have been done in camera, which is in private. 